If it's Monday, President Biden sharpens his criticism of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, warning that an invasion of southern Gaza is a, quote, red line for the U.S., even as Netanyahu remains defiant that Israeli forces will vindicate the region, red line or not. Plus, President Biden and former President Trump hit the trail and each other on key issues from Social Security and Medicare to spending to foreign aid for Ukraine as the 2024 rivals ramp up their attacks in the race for the White House. And the nation's top intelligence officials testify on Capitol Hill that Russia and China remain top security threats as foreign aid to Ukraine sits in legislative limbo. And the House eyes a vote on banning TikTok as soon as this week. Hello there. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Ryan Nobles in Washington, where a growing rift between President Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu is on full display. The Israeli leader is now vowing to press ahead with the ground invasion of southern Gaza, despite new warnings from President Biden that doing so would cross a red line. It's all coming as civilians in Gaza mark the start of Ramadan with no sign of a ceasefire in sight. Over the weekend, in an exclusive interview with MSNBC, President Biden ramped up his criticisms of Israel's conduct, saying that Netanyahu is hurting Israel by not doing more to prevent civilian harm in Gaza. The president also issued a new warning. Take a listen. He must, he must, he must pay more attention to the innocent lives being lost as a consequence of the actions taken. He's hurting, in my view, he's hurting Israel more than helping Israel by making the rest of the world. It's contrary to what Israel stands for. What is your red line with Prime Minister Netanyahu? Do you have a, a, a red line? For instance, would invasion of Rafah, which you have urged him not to do, would that be a red line? It is a red line, but I'm never going to leave Israel. The defense of Israel is still critical, so there's no red line. I'm going to cut off all weapons so they don't have the Iron Dome to protect them. They don't have. But there's red lines that if he crosses and they can, he cannot have 30,000 more Palestinians dead. You can certainly get a sense of the tightrope that President Biden is trying to walk on this issue as he navigates the intense divisions inside his own party for the support of Israel. Netanyahu is firing back at the president's comments, saying that Israeli forces will move into Rafah. Netanyahu told Politico that he has a red line of his own to make sure an attack like October 7th never happens again. Netanyahu also rejected the idea of a Palestinian state, this despite President Biden saying in a State of the Union address just last week that a two-state solution was the only path to lasting peace. The public tit-for-tat comes amid an escalating humanitarian situation in Gaza as the U.S. and its partners work to get more aid in. Earlier today, the U.S. carried out its seventh round of airdrops into Gaza, which included food and water. Meanwhile, the temporary humanitarian port in Gaza, which the president announced just last week, could take up to 60 days to get fully operational, according to officials. That timeline puts the potential for more military action squarely in the spotlight, putting even more pressure on ceasefire negotiations. CIA Director Bill Burns, who was in the Mideast on Friday for those ongoing negotiations, was on Capitol Hill today for the annual Worldwide Threats Hearing. Here's what he had to say about the status of those talks. We're going to continue to work hard at this. I don't think anybody can guarantee success. What I think you can guarantee is that the alternatives are worse for innocent civilians in Gaza who are suffering under desperate conditions, uh, for the hostages and their families um, who are suffering also under very desperate conditions, and for all of us. Joining me now is Kelly O'Donnell at the White House and NBC News Chief Foreign Correspondent Richard Engel. He is in Cyprus, where the aid for Gaza remains docked. Uh, Kelly, let's start with you. How is the White House reacting to this rebuke by Prime Minister Netanyahu, and how much is the relationship between the two leaders frayed? Well, certainly the White House is trying to defend that relationship in the big 
picture sweep of history and of this moment. But as you've already indicated, there is such a careful calibration going on from the president and from the administration trying to show the support for Israel while also trying to lean heavily into influence that they've done so behind the scenes and now making more of that public about the ways in which they would like Israel to conduct certain aspects of its operation. So today, officials are telling us the relationship is good. It has not been frayed. At the same time, they acknowledge that Benjamin Netanyahu and the president have not spoken in a period of weeks. However, they have spoken more than a dozen times since October 7th. So the president is trying to make clear that he is unwavering in, it, in the U.S.'s ultimate commitment to Israel, but tactically and strategically, he would like to see different steps taken. That, of course, is playing out on the world stage. It has its own domestic political concerns for both President Biden and the prime minister. And at this point, the the vulnerabilities that appear on the surface of the relationship are something that are coming into view that we haven't always seen. And they are trying to reinforce uh, the underpinnings of the U.S.-Israel relationship to try to get through this difficult time. Ryan? Yeah, and Kelly, it's interesting because the president has drawn this new red line. He didn't really put many specifics behind it or even say what the consequences would be for crossing a red line. But he also said he wouldn't stop sending weapons to Israel. So what could the consequences be if Israel does eventually launch this ground oper operation into Rafah? Well, that is where the president is playing this very close to his vest. He does not want to signal a, a sort of uh, you do this and I withdraw that kind of approach. At the same time, he wants to try to use his public displeasure as a means of leverage. And can he be persuasive for Netanyahu? That remains to be seen. And also trying to speak to the concerns that have been growing within his own party on the world stage about the catastrophic effects of uh, this military conflict for ordinary citizens of Gaza, people who are not directly involved in the conflict. And of course, Israel has always maintained that Hamas works within the, uh, the domestic population of Gaza, within uh, the communities there and making it much harder to try to eradicate the fighters from the population. But what we have seen with starvation and concerns, so the president is trying alternatives, which is emphasizing humanitarian aid is one of the big things the U.S. can do, right? Okay, Kelly O'Donnell, live at the White House. Thank you for that, Kelly. Let's go to you now, Richard. Uh, you've also spent quite a bit of time in that region. And as Palestinians begin to mark Ramadan, talk to us a little bit about the stark differences that they're experiencing this year and how soon could we see Israel move into Rafah? Well, I'm, I'm told from sources in the region and in the United States uh, that it is a matter of timing, that it is not a question of if but when, that Israel will move in, will move in in force uh, against uh, Hamas in Rafah, uh, and that it will be devastating for the people. Uh, there are roughly 2.3 million people in, in Gaza. By now, I think most of us have become familiar with the, the map. It is a uh, sort of a long, thin area. Uh, generally, it was the north that was the most heavily populated around Gaza City. Now, almost everyone in the north has moved south, south of an area uh, in the middle called Wadi Gaza. There are about 300,000 people or so left in the north. The rest, about 2 million, are south of that midpoint, and many of them are in Rafa. The, the, the issue is, if Ish Israel goes in, uh, which I'm told they, they will do, uh, perhaps it, it, over the next couple, couple, couple of weeks, month or so, uh, that not only will they be going into a densely populated area, because people can't leave Gaza, the, the entire territory is sealed off, has been sealed off for a long time, that if they are suddenly forced to go north, there's nothing left to go back to. There has been such massive destruction in northern Gaza because of the Israeli military assault that you could see a huge population shift, a million, million and a half people uh, or so being forced to move north to what is now a wasteland, a wasteland where there is starvation, most of the uh, acute starvation that we're seeing in Gaza. And it, the UN says it is borderline famine, which is a, uh, a, a designation that they take very seriously, is in the north. Uh, that uh, population there, 300,000 or so, are facing the worst conditions. So that is where these aid, aid drops 
uh, have primarily been focused uh, on on the north, and that is where the, the the pier they're talking about building eventually might end up being. Uh, that is where this aid ship that is in Cyprus is trying to go, uh, but it is delayed. And it, and uh, aid agencies around the world say that it is because Israel is imposing draconian restrictions on what can go into Gaza, who can come out of Gaza as Israel continues its its mission to, to root out uh, Hamas. And uh, this ship, as an example, has already been inspected. It is already loaded. Uh, the, 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 the contents are already covered in a tarp. It was inspected by Cypriot customs officials, a process that was overseen by Israeli officials, yet it remains here. And uh, you, you also talked about those those aid drops, those uh, from, those drops from from aircraft. They are I, I, largely symbolic. A lot of them are largely photo ops. They do some good, uh, but each plane, each C-130, carries the equivalent of a truck. Uh, it is enormously an enormously expensive way, and at times a lethal way, because uh, some of those pallets dropped on people uh, last week, killing five Palestinians, according to witnesses and health officials. So not only is it inefficient and expensive, uh, it, it is not nearly making uh, the, the difference, nor is this one ship going to make much of a difference when it eventually uh, gets clearance, if it gets clearance. Uh, aid agencies say the only real solution is loosening uh, the, the controls, letting more of that inspected aid to get in by road into the Gaza Strip. Okay, Richard Engel, uh, live for us uh, in Cyprus. Richard, thank you so much for that report. Let me now bring in Michael Orn, the former Israeli ambassador to the United States. Uh, so, Michael, uh, just your reaction uh, to this rift that we're seeing between Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Biden. How concerned uh, should Netanyahu be uh, about what appears to be Biden's growing frustration? I think that's just Netanyahu's concerned. Uh, all the people of Israel is concerned. Uh, the United States is our ultimate ally. The United States, uh, under the Biden administration, has cast three vetoes against uh, attempts by the Security Council to impose a ceasefire. And a ceasefire, from Israel's perspective, means Hamas gets away with mass murder and Israel can't restore its internal security. Uh, large swaths of Israel will simply remain uninhabitable and Hamas will emerge from those tunnels, uh, rearm, reorganize, and launch another deadly attack. So the ceasefire... The, the vetoing of ceasefire is crucial. The supply of ammunition is also crucial. So those two, ammo and veto, uh, are lifelines for Israel. But having said that, seeing that the United States is getting increasingly frustrated uh, and may try itself to demand a ceasefire or red line, as the uh, president intimated in his most recent interview, is a source of concern. I think that also Israelis are rather kind of confused, uh, frankly, because these policies aren't Netanyahu's policies. The Prime Minister of Israel is not the commander in chief of the IDF, the government is. And this government is a national unity government. Uh, these policies are Israeli national policies. Uh, if Israel goes into Rafah, and I believe I agree with Richard Engel that Israel will go into Rafah, it's a matter of not um, not if, but when. But that won't be the decision of the Prime Minister Netanyahu, it'll be the decision of the Israeli government. Uh, which includes people from the center, even center left. And, and those those policies will be uh, supported by the vast majority of Israelis. Uh, interesting enough, when we talk about the delays in the in the aid, uh, aid to the Palestinians is not very popular in the state of Israel because Israelis feel that Hamas will not let us know anything about the hostages, not their names, not whether they've received the a, uh, the uh, medicines that have been sent to them, and that this is the only leverage that Israelis have over Hamas. The Israeli government has gone against public opinion. In, uh, in letting aid in. And, and the major issue is, is not the delays caused by, by Israel. Uh, our officials tell us that uh, the delays are caused by the UN and other agencies who won't take the aid in. So you can have that ship sail from Cyprus. It's going to get to Cyprus. It's going to get to, to Gaza. Maybe I don't know where it's going to dock, but who's going to take the aid in? Right now, the only forces taking aid into Gaza, as you heard from that convoy last week that had this tragic outcome, uh, are Israeli forces. Um, and even at the, now, I think even the administration is saying that yeah. if they build here in the dock, American troops are not going to take the aid in. Israel's going to have to take the aid in. Yeah. So let's talk, though, more specifically about this red line. Uh, you mentioned that it is a government decision. Uh, are the government officials there, not just Netanyahu, the entire war cabinet, are they taking it seriously? And, and do they feel that the red line has any teeth? Are, are they worried at all that the support the United States has provided them could wane if they continue uh, down this trajectory? I think, of course, they take it very, very seriously, and it should be a source of concern. 
Um, I, again, I'm going back to the president's interview yesterday. Where he says, I'm not going to cut off aid to Israel. I'm going to continue to give Israel Iron Dome. Iron Dome is a defensive weapon. It's not an offensive weapon. Uh, Iron Dome doesn't have much good to use in, in er eradicating and uprooting Hamas uh, in Gaza. It's defending against rockets, and Israel has eliminated most of Hamas's uh, rocket uh, firing capacity. So maybe there was a, there was a bit of a, a, a hint there about how it could be a change in the policy of supplying munitions. But at the end of the day, Ryan, end of the day, Israel has no choice. Israel mm -hmm. has no choice but to eradicate Hamas, because without eradicating Hamas, basically Israel will could even literally cease to exist. We lose our reason for existing to protect our people and protect our land. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned about how these are decisions made by a government, but there does appear to be some cracks. I mean, we saw Benny Gantz. Uh, he drew some criticism uh, from uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's allies for his visit to the U.S. earlier this month. Is there any sense that the wartime unity government is starting to crack or fall apart? We certainly see some cracks. We have. Um, and that's the unity government. I don't see major cracks in the Israeli population itself. Uh, you know, we've been in battle now in very tense of combat for more than five months, 250 soldiers killed. You haven't seen any major anti-war movement in Israel, no major protests against the war. You see hostage uh, family protests, and there are, div there are divisions even within that camp. But And you're going to have, uh, you're always going to have uh, demonstrations against Netanyahu, and they are escalating now, but not against the war itself. I think there's very close to a national consensus that we have no choice but to finish the job of uprooting Hamas. Other, without that, Israel, life in Israel simply can't go on. Mm -hmm. All right. Ambassador Michael Oren, thank you so much for your perspective, sir. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. And coming up, we are on the road with President Biden as he hits Battleground New Hampshire on the heels of dueling rallies with Donald Trump in Battleground Georgia. Plus, on this day four years ago, think back, the World Health Organization declares a pandemic. The president addresses the nation, the NBA suspends its season, and a Hollywood megastar tests positive for COVID-19. We'll look back on the day that changed everything. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Right now, President Biden is hitting the campaign trail and hitting the airwaves. Moments ago, he spoke at an event in Manchester, New Hampshire, as he plans to head to the battlegrounds of Wisconsin and Michigan later this week. It comes as the campaign is going on the offensive, seeking to capitalize on last week's State of the Union. This weekend, releasing a new ad tackling the issue of the president's age head on. Look, I'm not a young guy. That's no secret. But here's the deal. I understand how to get things done for the American people. I led the country through the COVID crisis. Today, we have the strongest economy in the world. I passed a law that lowers prescription drug prices. Caps insulin at $35 a month for seniors. For four years, Donald Trump tried to pass an infrastructure law, and he failed. I got it done. Meanwhile, former President Trump also turning his attention to the general election, attacking the president and mocking his battle to overcome a childhood stutter during a rally in Georgia on Saturday. We all heard Crooked Joe's angry, dark, hate-filled rant of a state of the union address. Wasn't it? Didn't it bring us together? Remember, he said, I'm going to bring the country to, 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 together. Joe Biden should not be shouting angrily at America. America should be shouting angrily at Joe Biden. Everything Joe Biden touches turns to <laughs> everything. And that's just a sample of what we saw there. And joining me now in New Hampshire is NBC White House correspondent Aaron Gilchrist. And with me on the set is NBC's Garrett Hake, who has been covering all things Donald Trump. Uh, so, Aaron, let's start with you in the Granite State. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, the president there in New Hampshire. What did we hear today? Well, the president uh, came here, Ryan, and said that he was here to present his budget proposal for 2025. That's how he opened. And he talked a lot about what he wants to do around health care costs and lowering health care costs for Americans. You know he referenced that in a State of the Union address and today said that in particular that he was looking to Congress to approve a plan that's a part of his budget, his $7 trillion budget uh, proposal that would reduce the cost for prescription drugs for all Americans, not just people who uh, receive benefits through Medicare. 
That was a core part of what he had to say today. And this was not uh, a campaign event. This was actually an official event, sort of something more typical of what, of what you'd see coming after the State of the Union address. But there was a campaign tone to what the president had to say. He did address his predecessor, as he's described Donald Trump in the past, and he did use his name as well today. I want you to hear a little bit of what he said about uh, former President Trump and Republicans. If anyone tries to cut Social Security, Medicare, or raise retirement age again, I will stop them. Republicans will cut Social Security and Medicare to give us more tax cuts for the wealthy. Even this morning, Donald Trump said cuts to Social Security and Medicare are on the table again. But the bottom line is, he's still at it. I'm never going to allow that to happen. The president was uh, a, a bit more muted today at this event than he has been at some of the other events he held over the weekend in Atlanta and in the Philadelphia area on Friday. Uh, the event here has wrapped up in Gosstown, New Hampshire. The president is on his way back to Washington right now. The guys are breaking down the room, Ryan. Uh, but those messages, those things that we heard from the president today, you can expect to hear that much more between now and November 5th. Yeah, I mean, expand on that, Aaron. It, it does seem like he is officially on the campaign trail now. And, and is this blitz that we're seeing this week? Is that his new campaign permanent posture? Are we going to see him more visible as the general election continues? Yeah, you're absolutely right. The campaign has said that uh, they're declaring this month, this month of March, uh, a month of action and that we will see the, the, princi the uh, principles, the, the president, vice president, first lady, second gentleman, will all be crisscrossing the country delivering the president's campaign message. We know that the vice president was out west in Arizona and Nevada over the weekend while the president was here on the East Coast. Uh, he's got stops in Michigan and Wisconsin coming up this week as well. And this is just the beginning, obviously, of what we're going to see from the president, particularly in this month, but certainly uh, in the months to come as the campaign continues to, to, to sort of roll out. Uh, and they've got a huge war chest with which to work. $140 million, I believe, is what they told us last week, uh, not to mention a $30 million ad buy. You ran that uh, commercial that started running this weekend across the country. And so they've got uh, the, the, the manpower, if you will, as well as the uh, air power, over the air power, that they're going to be using to, to go up against Donald Trump. Okay, Aaron Gilchrist, live in New Hampshire. Uh, thank you for that, Aaron. Uh, Garrett, let's turn to you now. Uh, Donald Trump uh, could actually officially uh, clinch the Republican nomination uh, during tomorrow's primaries. Of course, Nikki Haley's already dropped yep. out, so he's ostensibly already there. I mean, what does the campaign look like from here on out for the former president? Well, in the short term, they've got to scale up. They do not have a huge war chest like President Biden does, and they need to address that. So I think you're going to see a focus on fundraising. You're going to see a focus on getting the party organized again. We just saw the installation of the new RNC chair and co-chair last week, including the former president's daughter-in-law, Chris LaCivita, who's the campaign operative who's sort of bridging the Trump campaign in the RNC, clearly trying to staff up and build out that organization because right now the Trump uh, campaign is not a full-scale presidential operation. They very much have to expand and very much have to build out the structure of a campaign or they're going to get swamped by the field organizing, the ground game, the apparatus of the White House right now, which they just can't match. And let's talk a little bit about the message that he's delivering. It's interesting the clip we played was him accusing Joe Biden of being dark and divisive at the yeah. State of the Union. But that was the sense you kind of got from this speech you gave over the weekend, isn't it? Yeah, look, this was a rally in northwest Georgia, Marjorie Taylor Greene's district. He was playing the hits, basically, <laughs> for a very red uh, corner of the state and an audience that I think is, expects that kind of thing. The message with Trump is... Cons it Consistency in its inconsistency, right? He can be all over the place kind of from one event to the next, but he's going to keep going back to the core issues. Lately, it's been immigration, heavily focused on this concept of migrant crime. He has made Lake and Riley, the nursing student in Georgia who was murdered, uh, I guess, last month now, uh, into a cause celeb on the right. Uh, he met with her family before this last event. On, on, on sort of that big picture message, he's much clearer. He's going to hammer the president on the border. He's going to try to talk about some of these economic issues. But it's stuff like the clips you play played that get all the attention, the personal insults, the divisive stuff, the attacks on the prosecutors and the people investigating him. There's no clean pivot here. There's no general election Trump. This is what you get. And I think it's been the problem that he has had to the degree you think it's a problem going back to 2015, where he can never fully get out of his own way. He's always going to be doing a little bit of policy and a little bit of this personal grievance. And then, of course, there's the legal issues that are still yeah. dogging him. Even if maybe none of these uh, cases actually go to trial, he's still repeatedly attacking E. Jean Carroll 
and he's appealing these penalties in the, in the defamation case. Is there concern from Trump world that he could face yet even more legal trouble if he can't stop talking about this? I think, broadly speaking, Trump world feels like they've pulled an inside straight here a little bit. Given the delays in the bigger cases because of the Supreme Court, uh, given the problems in Georgia with Fonnie Willis, uh, potentially getting disqualified from that case, getting completely bogged down. This New York Stormy Daniels case going first, which the Trump uh, world largely feels like the negatives of that are kind of baked in. Um, they feel reasonably good about the legal issues. I think the bigger question is the cost, right? This has become a money black hole for the Trump organization, the Trump, I say that, not the company, the Trump organization, but sort of Trump world writ large. All of this is expensive potentially getting more expensive all the time mm -hmm. if Donald Trump keeps talking about it in the case of E. Jean Carroll, although her lawyers seem today to be not interested in pursuing any further claims against him. I think that's going to be a bigger monetary drag on the Trump campaign mm -hmm. than it is a, a focus or sort of editorial drag going forward, but we'll see. Okay, Garrett Haig, thanks, appreciate it. You bet. And up next, as President Biden and former President Trump spar over aid to Ukraine, I'll talk to a Democratic lawmaker on the House Armed Services Committee about where the feud over foreign funding stands on Capitol Hill. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. As President Biden hits the campaign trail today, he's also sending Congress his budget for the 2025 fiscal year. It's chock full of Democratic priorities, and it's almost certain to be opposed by Republicans. It will most likely serve to show the president's policy vision as he runs for re-election. It also comes as Congress has yet to resolve spending for this fiscal year, while it also struggles to find a way forward on aid to Ukraine. Joining me now to talk about all of this and more on set is Virginia Democratic Congresswoman Jennifer McClellan. Uh, Congresswoman, thank you so much for being here. You and I go way back from my, my time in Richmond, so I appreciate you being here. Uh, let's talk first about the budget situation. Uh, you guys still haven't finished the 2024 uh, appropriations package. Are you confident that the remaining bills that need to be passed will be done by March 22nd? Well, let's say I'm hopeful. Uh, the House Republicans have found a way to turn even simple must-pass legislation into to a chaotic game of brinksmanship. Uh, but I am hopeful that we do have a deal going forward and that we uh, will pass that bill on time. And it seems as though the speaker doesn't want to deal with the supplemental aid package for Ukraine and Israel and others until after you clear the appropriations process. Are you optimistic about that package as well, or do you have some concerns? I I'm cautiously optimistic, but I am very concerned that with the increasing rhetoric we're hearing from the Republican Party about not wanting to stand firm with our uh, allies in Ukraine. Uh, today, I heard they're talking about a loan mm -hmm. program instead of direct aid. I and mean, we have got to get aid to Ukraine as quickly as possible so that they can defend themselves against Putin. And hopefully we will do that. Well, let me ask you about that idea of uh, trying to package this, at least as a loan, as a way to bring over some of these skeptical conservative Republicans. Do you think that's practical? If, if a bill like that were on the table, would you at least consider it? I, I would consider it. You know, the devil's always in the details, as we have seen with these bills. But I think we need to act as quickly as possible to get aid to Ukraine. Okay, so let's talk about Speaker Mike Johnson. And you've already alluded to the fact that he has somewhat of an unruly caucus to keep in line. I want to play for you what your, your leader, Hakeem Jeffries said this weekend about Democrats potentially protecting Johnson to help get a vote on Ukraine aid. Take a listen. Will you prevent him from being ousted? We haven't had that conversation as a caucus, but I have made the observation that I believe there are a reasonable number of members, if the speaker were to do the right thing, that don't believe that he should fall as a result of it. That sounds like a yes. So you missed the initial Kevin McCarthy drama. You've been in Congress now for a year. You were there for the second round of it. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any part of you, just as an individual member, not speaking broadly for the caucus, that would like to prevent seeing that sort of chaos again if a motion to vacate were brought up for Mike Johnson? Would you be a part of a group, potentially, that could protect him if he did the things that you were hoping in terms of Ukraine aid and appropriations process? You know, I'm going to have to look at, at that at that moment. I think the difference is with Kevin McCarthy, he proved from day one that he was untrustworthy. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Speaker Johnson has proved from day one of his speakership that he can't control his caucus. But I'm not sure 
anybody can. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when push comes to shove, he has uh, put legislation on the table and Democrats have provided the votes necessary to get it passed. Um, and I think we will be the adults in the room and look at what we need to do to govern mm -hmm. uh, and, and we'll see what happens. So, but it's not something you rule out right out of hand. That if the scenario were correct, it, there's a possibility that something like that could happen. I, I don't rule anything out, out of hand. <laughs> I, I take a look at the circumstances as they present themselves. Okay, great. Uh, so I want to talk to you a little bit about the TikTok legislation now that you're set to vote on uh, as soon as Wednesday. Uh, it could ba ban the app depending on what happens in terms of how ByteDance responds to it. it the, the legislation calls for ByteDance to divest its interest. Pre President Biden says that he'll sign it into law. Do you support the bill? Will you vote for it? You know, I'm looking at it very carefully, uh, wading through. There are two different bills. Uh, I think the one from uh, Representative Pallone that focuses on making sure that uh, we protect consumer information, I, I, I definitely will vote for. I'm looking at the other one. Mm -hmm. Look, I think the issue here is not TikTok per se. It's the fact that the Chinese government mm -hmm owns a company that is collecting very sensitive information from American citizens that it can use to create an algorithm that will provide very addictive um, uh, information to provide messages and videos that could mislead the American people and manipulate our elections. And we should be very concerned about that and focus on how to keep that from happening. Is that a broader social media question or is it a TikTok specific question? This is a Chinese government situation. Mm -hmm. It is the fact that the Chinese government owns a company that is collecting this data um, and that we need to make sure that we protect uh, the private, sensitive information of American citizens. I mean, the Biden campaign is using TikTok right now. Some of your Democratic colleagues use TikTok on a regular basis to re reach their constituents. Do you think that's hypocritical at all, or do you think there's a way to use it in a safe manner? Well, they don't use it on their private phones. They don't use it on their government phones. I think, uh, and that's part of what we need to look at, is what information is TikTok gathering? And I think when the president's campaign or some of my colleagues use I don't use it. Mm -hmm. But when they mm -hmm. use it, I think they're very careful what they have on that phone mm -hmm. other than TikTok so that the information gathered is not as sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, the average user of TikTok doesn't do that. You know, mm -hmm. most of my friends, I kind of look at them and say, do you really want the Chinese government mm -hmm. getting access to everything that on your phone? Because they are. And then they kind of pause. So right. that's the real issue. Yeah. Uh, let's turn to the campaign trail now. Uh, President Biden in New Hampshire today is going to go to Wisconsin and Michigan later. A very busy campaign schedule. Uh, do you think that the combination of him getting out on the road, his strong speech on Thursday, do you think that's going to help to quell some of these concerns about his age and fitness for office? I do. Look, I saw he was being in the room for the State of the Union. What I saw was a man who is feisty and ready to lead and from day one has led he uh, he inherited a country that was in the middle of a of a pandemic in the middle of a financial crisis and he got things done regardless of his age he will continue to get things done and fight for the american people while the former president fights for himself mm -hmm. yeah let's Let's talk now a little bit about your first year in office. I mean, you're a veteran legislator. I don't mean that because <laughs> you're still very young. Uh, but you were, were in the House of Delegates, you were in the State Senate in Virginia. Now you're here in Congress. I mean, just reflect on that first year. Has it been frustrating? Is it hopeful? I mean, how do you, is this what you envisioned when you took the job? Uh, yes and no. I mean, all, <laughs> of the, all of the above. It, you know, the joke I use is it feels like I graduated high school and went to college, although there are some days, you know, in the middle of the speaker fight, I wondered if I regressed to middle school. Right, right. right. Um, but but it's, you know, it's the honor of a lifetime to be able to not only help people, um, but to do so making history as the first black woman elected uh, to Congress from Virginia. Um, and, and even despite the, the Republican chaos, I've been able to get things done um, just last week, getting $15 million in community project funding you know, to help with the Richmond combi combined sewage overflow system. Um, and, and the survivors of domestic violence have been able to get uh, provisions in the NDAA to help with mental health services for our yep. service members. So, um, and then you get nights like the State of the Union yeah. that are pretty exciting. Yeah, well, you and I go way back. It's like mm -hmm. we picked right up where we left off. So Congressman McClellan, thank you so much for being here. I thank you. It. And after the break, TikTok, Brit blowback and ramped up rhetoric. The panel is next. You're watching Meet the Press Now.
Welcome back. The House could vote as early as Wednesday on legislation that might pave the way for TikTok to be banned in the United States. The House Energy and Commerce Committee voted unanimously last week to approve a bill that would ban TikTok if its Chinese-owned parent company did not essentially sell it. That was, of course, before Donald Trump weighed in. The former president appeared to come out against a ban in a social media post last Thursday, which came curiously after he'd reportedly spoken with a billionaire TikTok investor. But this morning, Donald Trump told CNBC's Andrew Ross Sorkin that the social media company was a national security threat. There are a lot of uh, users. There's, you know, a lot of good, and there's a lot of bad with TikTok. But the thing I don't like is that without TikTok, you can make Facebook bigger. And I consider Facebook to be an enemy of the people, along with a lot of the media. But do you believe that TikTok is a national security threat or not? Because if it is, and, and I believe that your, the emergency powers order that you had put in place at the time suggested that it was, it, was that not true? I, I do believe that, I do believe it, and we have to very much go into privacy and, and make sure that we are protecting the American people's privacy and data rights. For more now, I'm joined by my panel, Leanne Caldwell, Washington Post Live anchor and the co-author of The Early 202, Fas Shakir, Democratic strategist and advisor to Bernie Sanders, and Mark Short, who served as, as uh, Vice President Mike Pence's chief of staff uh, when he was the vice president. He's now a Meet the Press contributor. So, Mark, let's start with you. I mean, you were in the administration when there was this initial attempt to try and ban TikTok. It never actually took. Now Donald Trump kind of all over the place, initially saying he was against the TikTok ban, now saying again that it's a national security threat. I know it's a difficult task, but can you interpret the former president for here? What, what is he trying to say? Well, he seems to be wavering. I certainly hope it's not because TikTok investors have come to him and, and offered uh, resources that perhaps the campaign needs, because I think his position four years ago was the right position. And I certainly hope that Congress moves forward with the ban. I think it was a remarkable 50 to nothing vote mm -hmm. in Energy and Commerce Committee. And I think that the, that would, the precedent for that was laid by the executive order your newscast mentioned mm -hmm. four years ago when we put forward that, that place to, to last people to ban we talk about it as a ban I guess the right. initiative really is to try to get it to divest right 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 so Liam let's talk about its chances uh, on Capitol Hill mm -hmm. it's gonna probably get a vote in the House on Wednesday it seems as though it's moving in the direction of being passed but it could have a tougher go in the Senate what's your sense yeah so um, in the House the fact that it was a 50 to 0 vote coming out of committee is quite significant not many things happen on a unanimous uh, this Congress yeah. no yeah. no <laughs> So, so it looks like it's moving. Um, there was some question today that perhaps Donald Trump's, uh, per, you know, criticism of TikTok could derail that a little bit. It doesn't seem that that's going to be the case. Um, in the Senate, it is a little bit more challenging. There's been efforts to uh, ban TikTok much more broadly. Uh, they have successfully passed bills to ban it on government mm -hmm. devices. Um, so this has been a very difficult political issue, especially for Democrats. Um, this is, no one wants to upset millions and millions of young voters, mm -hmm. which could be the repercussion, even though the plan, the, the goal is to try to divest and not, mm -hmm. you know, dismantle TikTok, but um, but it's, it's very difficult politically. Yeah, we'll talk about that, Faz. I mean, a lot of the people you're connected with, young progressives, use TikTok a lot. They use it not just for silly dance videos, they use it to send out a message. How politically, uh, li how liable uh, could Democratic politicians be held if a ban like this goes into place? I don't place? think it would just be Democratic, but all politicians, yeah. I think, be worried about, should be worried about banning a platform that generally has a sense of delivering speech. That, that's what I, you know, firmly believe is that generally if you're going to stop a platform from being able to advocate <clears throat> and engage in speech, you should have a pretty damn good reason for it. And the national security reasons are the ones that have been promulgated as the ones that we should compel a U.S. ownership for mm -hmm. and allow at least just some unit U.S. ownership to work in compliance with the federal government to ensure security reasons. I would feel like personally there's never been an adequate public job of telling people what are the security harms when you're using this device. If you're talking to millions and millions of Americans who are out there using this device right now, and the government is told you don't use your own device, right, if mm -hmm. you're going to do TikTok, mm -hmm. shouldn't regular people also know mm -hmm. what, what the heck, I, I, as a user, somebody, as you said, has an organization that uses a TikTok. I've never felt like I've gotten sufficient information, but tell me what I'm doing. What am I doing that is going to uh, even make me susceptible from a national security perspective? I think that today in the news we're concerned about the Chinese potentially putting surveillance inside cranes 
Mm -hmm. Yet they're putting in everybody's phone, and that's not a national security concern. They're definitely collecting data on all Americans who use the app, and there's no doubt the algorithms they use are intended to push things that are more divisive than what they actually have in their own home country of China, where they don't allow the same algorithms for people who use it, and they basically use it to promote pro-China um, videos inside their own country. So I think, again, it, it, it is a matter of trying to divest. Let's keep in mind, in China, what they do is they simply steal your intellectual property and just take it. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to advocate is to say divest and have an American investor. Is it possible to divest? Is it that simple? I feel like it, it could be, and it should be. Uh, obviously, the government hasn't really compelled that action in recent memory. I'm for those kinds of things. You know, I have progressive governments that says we stand for the people and not just because a, a company makes billions of dollars in profits, they could do whatever the hell they want. But I mean, my perspective, well, Mark, hearing everything that he said, I agree with, is to say then, well, I have the same concern of a, a Facebook or Elon mm -hmm. Musk or, you know, it's not a Chinese autocrat who's right. running them, but they are, when you put Using big data, data. Yeah. in a huge, in the hands of, and we always see it with Elon Musk, the desire to use a platform for personal aims and objectives when you're that powerful, I do believe it compels government action. So I'm not against government action. I just want to make a, a, hear a good public case. And I don't view Musk or Zuckerberg as adversaries to the United States of America. And I think that is the central difference. Right. But there are talks, broader talks about social media in general, the impact it's having on the country and, and Congress trying to wrestle with that. Congress, of course, social media changes in 15 minutes. Congress will take 20 years to pass something, as we know. Uh, let's move to a different issue here. And this is a fallout from Alabama Senator Katie Britt's State of the Union response on Thursday night. Leanne, what's your sense talking to Republicans and Democrats about her performance and then, of course, SNL skewering her this weekend? I don't think that anyone has said that she had a really good performance. Talking about banning something, can we ban the State of the Union response, please? <laughs> right. No one has ever done a good job. It always, you know, at best, it's forgettable. Right. Um, so, you know, Kitty Britt is a rising star in the Republican Party. Um, this is her first term in the Senate. She is well liked across the aisle. Uh, she has many friends in the Senate. She has many ambitions in the Senate as well. Um, but this was uh, not necessarily representative of what Katie Britt normally is, but this is what she did. And so now there's a lot of head scratching about where she goes and how she recovers from this. She's young. She can totally recover. But it's, uh, you know, there were unforced errors, especially with uh, the false claim about the migrant yeah, that she told. And let's talk about that, Mark. Uh, you know, she, it's beyond her performance, which, you know, that's subjective. She did, is facing scrutiny because she referenced a woman who'd been sex trafficked, but it actually didn't happen in the United States. It didn't even happen during the Biden administration. I mean, should she be called into question for bringing this into this speech at this time, especially given the point that she was trying to make? Sure, I think she has. I think it was a mistake to use that reference. But at the same time, Ryan, the reality is that we do know that more than half the young women who are transported by the cartels are sexually molested or raped. And so the incident she used was a mistake in using one from that happened during the George Bush administration. Having said that, she is a rising star. And I think people don't appreciate that for Alabama Republicans, probably nothing helps you more than being mocked by Saturday Night Live and being criticized <laughs> by the New York Times editorial page. And so she's going to be totally fine from this politically. She's going to continue to have a great career. I think that that was one incident where she should have not have used that specific incident. But it is true. The vast majority of women coming up from, through the cartels are sexually molested or raped. And I think it is a serious issue for the American people. And the border is a serious issue. Okay. Fast, anything you want to add? No, only that, only that there's a, you see a desire when the, Dem Biden took the issue away from Republicans, the mm -hmm. natural course would have been for her instead of promulgating false stories about migrants, you would be suggesting solutions. Mm -hmm. And some of the core solutions that conservatives signed up for have been taken off the table because Biden happens to agree with a fair mm -hmm. number of them. And now we're left with what, what are the distinctions? Honestly, I'm, I'm not trying to be provocative, but what are the distinctions? Maybe just build a wall, I guess. I, I'm not sure exactly where Republicans are now. I've not heard the Biden administration go back and advocate again for Remain in Mexico policy. I think there's a lot of parts of this border that were of his own creation, and he could have gone back and put these same executive orders that Donald Trump had in place. Well, I did hear them say, though, that they would be happy to engage in a program in which migrants, before they enter the United States, would go through an asylum process there on the other side. Okay. All right, we're going to have to leave it there, guys. You can keep talking about it. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm out of time. Leanne, Fast, Mark, thank you all for being here. We appreciate it. Still to come, preparing for the next pandemic. We're looking back on that day that Faz and I spent together that changed everything and looking ahead to the next global health emergency. You're watching Meet the Press now. We have therefore made the assessment that COVID-19 can be 
characterized as a pandemic. This is the most aggressive and comprehensive effort to confront a foreign virus in modern history. I am confident that by counting and continuing to take these tough measures, we will significantly reduce the threat to our citizens and we will ultimately and expeditiously defeat this virus. Uh, the NBA has now announced the suspension of their season. Um, I'm just going to read you their press release. The NBA announced that a player on the Utah Jazz has preliminarily tested positive for COVID-19. Actor Tom Hanks also making headlines after he posted on social media that he and his wife, Rita Wilson, have tested positive for the virus, saying, quote, we will be tested, observed, and isolated for as long as public health and safety requires. Do you remember that? Believe it or not, all of that happened on a single day. And believe it or not, that single day, which ushered in a hellish stretch of lockdowns, quarantines, and overwhelmed hospitals, was four years ago to the day. Four years later, doctors and scientists are already bracing for the next big one, the next pandemic. Dr. Paul Offit is among them. He's a member of the FDA's Vaccine Advisory Committee and the director of the Vaccine Education Center at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He is also the author of the new book, Tell Me When It's Over, an insider's guide to deciphering COVID myths and navigating our post-pandemic world. And uh, Dr. Offit, thank you for joining me. And I think many of us were asking that question repeatedly uh, over the year 2020, Tell Me When It's Over. But let's start uh, with a question that we often ask each other. Where were you on March 11th, 2020, and, and what do you remember most about that day? Well, so I work at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, I had uh, rounded on patients that were in our hospital uh, with COVID, and, and um, it was overwhelming. I, I, we had three floors of, of children with COVID. We had, um, you know, suspended elective surgeries. We were overwhelmed, and, and it was surprising in many ways. I think we were fooled by the first two coronavirus pandemics, the, the SARS-1 pandemic in 2002, which killed hundreds of people, but not hundreds of thousands, and then the MERS pandemic, which was in 2012, which killed hundreds of people, not hundreds of thousands. Here was a virus that ultimately would kill 7 million people worldwide, and, and more than a million people in this country because it was spread asymptomatically. That was the surprise. That's what we hadn't anticipated. And I think that's why it was so overwhelming. And when you look back on it now, how did misinformation contribute to the length and the severity of the pandemic? No, it's remarkable, actually. When you think we, we isolated this virus in January of 2020, 11 months later, due to, as Pres former President Trump alluded to, be, due to Operation Warp Speed, we had two large clinical trials with a technology, messenger RNA, we had never used to make a vaccine before. And these vaccines were remarkably effective and safe. And then within the next seven months, we vaccinated 70 percent of the U.S. population. I think that was the greatest scientific and medical accomplishment in my lifetime. And I'm old enough to remember the polio vaccine. Mm -hmm. Yet, in, in by mid-2021, you had about 30% of the U.S. population that simply refused to be vaccinated because of the misinformation and disinformation was out there. And as a result, about 300,000 people lost their lives unnecessarily. We, at some level, lost trust of the American public, and we're going to have to figure out a way how to get it back. And you, you write about this, about the anti-vaccination movement and how it became more of a political movement than a medical movement in the years before the pandemic. Uh, and this is what you're right. No longer were activists focusing on false claims about vaccine safety. Rather, the focus was now on medical freedoms, which activists believe would resonate better with legislators. Uh, how much harder is it to combat medical freedoms than medical efficacy? Right. Very hard because it sounds good, right? It's a matter of personal freedom, bodily autonomy. But the fact is, is this is a contagious disease. So it's really not a personal choice. When you choose not to get a vaccine like COVID vaccine, you're also making a choice for other people. And remember, there's about nine people in the United States who simply can't be vaccinated because they're getting immune suppressive therapies for their cancers or their autoimmune diseases. They depend on those around them to protect them. And I think this was sort of a real example of how people really were focused on themselves and not on the society that, that offered them many benefits. I, I, probably people don't want me to ask this question, but I feel like it's necessary. Is another global pandemic like the one we just emerged from, is it inevitable? Yes, you've had three pandemic coronaviruses in the last 20 years. I think you can assume there's going to be another one. And, and part of it is because 
Bats are often the, the, the original source of these viruses. And we, as we have more and more deforestation and the bat population becomes more and more involved with other mammalian populations. You can assume there's gonna be another pandemic. I worry that with all the pushback we've had in the name of medical freedoms, pushback on mandates like vaccine mandates, in some ways we may be less prepared for the next pandemic. Well, talk about that. I mean, how concerned are you about how prepared or not prepared we may be for the next pandemic? Very concerned. You've had hundreds and hundreds of pieces of legislation that have successfully pushed back on vaccines, and it, and not just COVID vaccines. I mean, what you're seeing now is an erosion in vaccine rates among kindergartens, and so you're seeing exactly what you would expect to see, an increase in measles cases, because measles is the most contagious of the vaccine-preventable diseases. It's always the canary in the coal mine. Well, Dr. Paul Offit, uh, during the pandemic, you were on television about six times a day. Uh, you're very good at it, but don't take this the wrong way. I just prefer you being off our televisions as much as possible because usually it's because we're dealing with something pretty difficult and your expertise is necessary. But thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. And we're back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. But NBC News Now coverage continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.